Good late afternoon, everyone. I'm Denis Stolyarov. I'm an assistant curator here. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you here for what I'm sure to be an exciting conversation between Katya and Sarah. Uh, so, you know, Katya Muramtsova is an artist responsible for these wonderful watercolor drawings. And also there is another room downstairs, probably you've seen it. Uh, and Professor Sarah Wilson is a professor of art history at the Kutod Institute of Art. And I'm proud to say my former academic supervisor. Um, and I should open the full credentials. Um, she published The Visual World uh, of French Theory, Figurations. Um, uh, published by Figurations, yep. Uh, so that's a wonderful book, my favorite of yours. Uh, and then later, Picasso, Marx, and Socialist Realism in France. Uh, Sarah was a principal curator of Paris Capital of the Arts at Royal Academy, London, and then Guggenheim Bilbao, and also of Pierre Klosowski at the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, she's preparing an anthology of her writing on over 30 women artists called She Plus Art. When is it coming out? Okay, okay, okay. So, um, Sarah first traveled to the USSR in 1981, and Sarah last traveled to, the US, uh, to, to Russia to, for the opening of GAS2 in Moscow in December 2021. Um, Sarah has supervised a lot of theses uh, on Russian art, including mine, uh, and published on artists Oleg Kolik, Alexander Ponomarov, and Simon Faibisovich in 2019. Uh, Sarah was appointed uh, Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres uh, in 1997, and she was awarded at, uh, the AICA Prize in 2015. Um, sorry, that uh, Katia, that I'm taking all the time to introduce Sarah, uh, but uh, I'm sure everybody knows you, and, uh, um, and I'm really looking forward to your conversation. Well, Katia, first of all, I'm very honored to be here. And I think this is a very important room for us to have our conversation in because we're surrounded by these anonymous people, many, many of them women, some of them carrying just blank pieces of paper and some of them saying, stand with Ukraine. And I think this is a brave and wonderful exhibition. And I'd first like to say, first of all, for everybody, that of course, Katia's got an absolutely splendid website that you've received many, many, many prizes, distinctions, and scholarships, that you've had a very international career extending to Japan with the great uh, period that's so important for you involving your teaching now in the United States, which I'm sure we'll get around to speaking about. And just out of curiosity for everybody, it was on that very last trip, which was so happy, to, um, to uh, Moscow in December 2020, that I first saw your work, I was being taken around the big show Diversity United by your sister, Elena Konyushina, who is here, hoping so much that we could get Elena to come to the court hall, which she's managed to do on a global talent visa. Uh, and then when she proudly announced that you were going to have a show here, I thought, what's been going on here? Completely independently, uh, our wonderful Elena Sudakova of Pushkin House discovered your work, I believe, in one of those exhibitions curated by Ekaterina Diogot at the Sterbischer Herst in Austria. So it's extremely coincidental. But when I was thinking of this, I was thinking that not only are we all, the audience, a sort of family, but there's not only a, an anonymous family around us, but downstairs with your very moving exhibition of political prisoners, one day all those prisoners will know that they were brought together in a family by you and they will be part of, part of today and part of an expanded and happier future. So um, I'd also just like to say before we begin that on Saturday, Katya drew my portrait and we had a long time to talk to each other. So first of all, Katya, I think it would be nice if you told everything a little bit about your trajectory before we launch into the very, very lovely PowerPoint you've prepared to introduce your work to people. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's an honor for me, and uh, I think this is one of the most important exhibitions in my life. So thank you so much, Pushkin House, for hosting it and for making everything possible, even my uh, crazy ideas with uh, shadow portraits that we uh, discuss later. So um, um, how I actually started to be an artist, we discussed it with Sarah before, uh, was um, because of Marcel Proust and because of his book, uh, In Search of Lost Time. Uh, that day I was a student at the philosophy department in Moscow State University and I always wanted to be an artist before but I didn't think that it's possible to be an artist because I thought it's something really, really inachievable because uh, nobody in my family were connected uh, with art at that time. So uh, I started to read this book. It's seven volumes, if you know, and uh, it's more than thousand pages. And I read it in one summer. And uh, this is a, an extraordinary book about time, about memory, about the high society, about history, about human relationships. But it's also a book about art. Uh, it's a book uh, that uh, where Proust uh, started uh, to become an artist by himself and he's describing the way of uh, his artistic process and of being an artist and uh, w when I lived with him for the whole summer reading this book um, he somehow convinced me that I also can be an artist so he actually changed my life um, and um, at the end of this book, I decided I will try, I will at least try. And I went to the um, academic drawing and painting classes and then to the Rochinka art, art School to study contemporary art. So this is a really interesting example how somebody from the past um, can change everything in your life when you listen to them very carefully. But obviously you must have started having quite a bit of success to then um, manage to achieve the scholarships that you did. Tell us about how finally your trajectory developed and you ended up in the United States. Um, I was very active in Russia as an artist and um, I was thinking that maybe it's interesting for me to go somewhere else to uh, maybe um, have some education in the West uh, because I knew that I knew Russian system very well, um, and I was curious what's, what kind of art world is in the States. So I applied to the Fulbright Fellowship, and I got it, and I went to do my master's degree in Richmond, Virginia, uh, in Virginia Commonwealth University, where I teach now. Um, so I think we'll get on to things about the difference between systems and... Uh, what you learnt from teaching and so forth a little bit later on in the conversation. Although I must say to everyone that when I was with you and we were having our conversation uh, and we were talking indeed even about teaching, I could see how I could see um, how good a teacher you were and how you understand the reciprocity of that kind of practice, how it's enriched you and how it's made you strong and you speak very well and very confidently in that way through a lot of practice, obviously using your English in America and with all the benefits of the distance, the critical distance, the neither being inside nor outside, all those issues that are not just straightforward, where were you, when and when did you do which exhibition, but something much more profound uh, and not quite linked to what we talk about when we talk about emigres or immigres. That's true, isn't it? It's much more of a, a cultural exploration for you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm. But then, um, shall we shall we go on to your PowerPoint and see some of the works? Yes, yes. Um, I was thinking to get started to it with the short video works that was my diploma uh, when I was a student at Rochin Card School. That's my first video. And I just want to tell a small story about this work and to do a small introduction. So it's titled In This Country uh, and um, it's interesting for me to discuss how this idea came to my mind because it's always interesting how the artists, where did they get their inspiration and their ideas. 
So actually the place, a very interesting place in Moscow inspired me to do this work. This place is called Palace of Pioneers. Can you imagine this? Uh, so I visited this place and I was shocked because in this um, palace for pioneers, there were a lot of modern kids, like from six to 18 years old, who did uh, a lot of craft, dancing, some, some like after school activity, but all the environment there was Soviet. Soviet songs, Soviet music, Soviet aircraft that uh, they constructed. And I was thinking, what do these kids who never experienced Soviet Union in their life and this country uh, um, and live in modern Russia, what do they think about Soviet Union? So I s asked um, two groups of school kids that time who were 10 and 12 years old to write an essay. How do you think people lived in Soviet Union? And they wrote these essays for me. And uh, based on these essays, I wrote this mythological story uh, in this country. Uh, and this is uh, about these implemented memories that we all have from our parents, from our grandparents. Uh, and um, we can discuss uh, it after watching it. It's nine minutes. And let's say that the, the um, subtitles are all taken from the children's essays. Yes, That's yes. That's what's so fun, I think. Mm -hmm. В этой стране люди работали, работали, работали. О себе совсем не думали. Людям было не важно, что они едят, где спят, как отдыхают. В этой стране люди не обращали внимания на одежду. Одевались не так хорошо. Мужчины одевались в галоши, в телогрейку, в легкую шапку и перчатки, когда работаешь. А женщины одевали кофты, перчатки, шарф на голову, чтобы голова не была видна. И тоже галоши. Такая одежда была удобнее всего, чтобы работать. В этой стране был красный флаг, поэтому в моде был красный цвет. Дети ходили в красных галстуках, женщины на празднике всегда одевали красные платья. Машины выпускались красного цвета. В этой стране были очереди. За колбасой были 20-километровые очереди. В этой стране колбаса одной фабрики была даже зеленой. В этой стране был главным тот человек, который лежит в отдельном доме на главной площади главного города. В этой стране в свободное время люди ходили навестить того главного человека в его домике на главной площади. Там люди встречались, пили чай, 
обменивались новостями. В этой стране люди работали на заводах и фабриках. Они делали бомбы, танки, машины, но не еду. Поэтому еды было мало. Для покупок люди пользовались талонами, но не деньгами, потому что в этой стране людям не давали деньги. В этой стране люди общались не по телефону или интернету, а встречались и общались. В этой стране дети все дни были на улице и гуляли. Вместо компьютера у детей была солома в зубах и футбольная площадка с мячом. Если детей отправляли за буханкой хлеба с младшим братом, то они по пути домой съедали половину хлеба. В этой стране было два общества. Одно высшее, а другое любило ездить на метро. В этой стране люди боялись говорить, даже думать, потому что все верили доносчикам. Даже профессия такая была. стране телевизор был редкой диковинкой. По телевизору показывали только хорошие новости. В этой стране дни рождения отмечались скромно. Новый год тоже не особо. Самый главный праздник был праздник труда. Люди в этой стране отказывались отдыхать. Они приходили с работы и сразу ложились спать. Сны люди не смотрели. В этой стране у всех были одинаковые мечты. Особенно люди этой страны мечтали полететь в космос. В этой стране война началась рано утром. Тогда все люди спали и не были готовы к войне. Поэтому в тот же день враги дошли до той главной площади, где лежал главный человек этой страны. Но люди этой страны все-таки отбили атаку. После войны было очень много убитых. В лесу этой страны были сбиты самолеты и танки, а в речке можно было найти атомную бомбу. В этой стране в 
все думали, что скоро война снова будет. Эта страна закончилась и больше не существует. Но в это не полностью можно верить. Может быть, эта страна еще существует? Люди там работают. И спортивные соревнования устраивают каждый год. so beautiful that was so beautiful this is green is it working hello i'll try again yes that's a little bit better i said that was so very beautiful it was very poignant the sound is very beautiful and what is interesting to me is on the one hand i see it for what it is it's fairy tale like qualities it's romanticism a long tradition, but on the other hand, I'm thinking of you as a creative artist at your school, and I'm thinking of the um, shadows on that bridge in Eisenstein, you know, that goes into... I'm thinking of all sorts of influences, and of course, when we see someone floating into space, a little non-person, we think of Kabakov. In fact, you talk, you talk to me about some of these influences, so... Uh, and yet, of course, it has this extremely beautiful innocence, which we as spectators know is an innocence which is going to be bruised in all sorts of ways. So despite its simplicity, it's very, very sophisticated. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about those um, figures from a previous generation who've inspired you and who one might glimpse in this. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of early cinema, rotate, rotating devices, uh, and of course shadows. So there's a big, big, big link up. We're almost in one of these rotating devices with shadows. So um, perhaps you could, I could pass the mic over to you at any rate, and you could talk about some of those issues. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, um, not only Eisenstein and early cinema was my inspiration, but also Plato and the cave uh, and uh, this legend that we cannot see the real world, we can also see the shadows of the real world. And since I wanted to talk about memory and uh, how this memory were implemented to these kids and um, I wanted to give this voice to somebody who can never be in charge of historical narrative because usually historical narrative is written by the authorities. Uh, and I wanted something opposite. I wanted uh, this naive uh, and very innocent um, point of view because I felt that propaganda, Russian propaganda, uh, started to be very cruel at that time, and they started to implement their own narratives into the people's minds and into the children's mind, even um, rewriting the school books and textbooks. So, um, yes, uh, it's not only visual inspiration, but also philosophical, of course, and uh, especially this... Um, picture is inspired by Kabakov uh, and uh, by his um, little creatures who flew away from their country to somewhere else, to the open space, to find their freedom. The cosmos, I heard that word at the end. Yeah. Always a big word in Russia. And you continue that because I know that your PowerPoint's going to begin with a series called um, uh, While You Were Sleeping I Planted a Tree. Yeah, we can go there so now. Uh, so this is another series of works, um, and 
I actually made it also inspired by the text, but in this case, I wrote the text by myself, and uh, it's a really small, like, couple sentence sentences, um, romantic text that I want uh, to read you while we're watching uh, this body of work. So it's titled, While You Were Sleeping, I Planted a Tree. Um, nobody among us knew exactly when or where they would sprout. Sometimes it was so sudden, in the evening a small bud, but the next morning already a branching tree. For others, uh, they grew slowly, getting stronger day by day, and until it became mature and ready to bear fruit, it was not certain if it was a birch tree or a cactus. I'm sorry, too fast. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, some were bothered by their tree and tried to pulling it out to stop it from putting down it, its roots. But once you pull it out here, it will grow there. Others, on the contrary, got used to their tree so much that they couldn't imagine another life, one without the tree or constant care about it. They knew it would remain long after they were gone, continuing to grow in all directions. That does remind me of Blake, that little one. I know mm -hmm. that. And I remember that Blake's, um, Blake was exhibited in Moscow. Yeah. Uh, his songs of innocence and experience. So innocence and experience is also a theme in your work, isn't it? Yeah, and I decided to continue this series. So uh, first I did it in 2018, and this year uh, it started to grow inside me again, as in the story, when you have something that's proud and you cannot control it. Um, and talking about shadows, uh, there is another important work for me that were made in 2018 uh, that is titled a quarter to 12, and here I was also inspired by the text, but by the text by the famous Russian poet, uh, Alexander Bloch, uh, and he wrote his poem that is titled 12, uh, and he did it uh, when the Russian Revolution broke. And um, I was thinking about him a lot, and I started working on this project in, two in 2017. So it was 100 year anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And um, I was thinking that Bloch experienced revolution and what I experienced by myself, how do I experience history? And I was thinking that I experience history on the streets when I go to the anti-corrupt protests, but also I experience it from the news feed, from my phone or like social media. So I started doing these drawings um, inspired by the news feed, and uh, I've decided to make it uh, an installation, also shadow installation, and m to show my own uh, rhythm of history, as Bloch did by the words in his poem, I've decided to do it by the image. Um, and here we can also watch, it's like one minute, just how it works um, in the space. And I will explain the technique. Yeah. That, that is that a kind of primitive epidioscope? You said yeah. you asked somebody to make those special projectors for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. It's just quite hard to understand it through the photos, so it's easier with the video. So there are three constructions, and they're all moving in the space, and uh, there are light bulbs behind every construction. So the shadows from my graphic, from my drawings, they're projected on the walls. So we can see the shadows and the constructions together. And tell us a little bit more about your soundtracks, because they're very sophisticated and lovely. And the soundtrack is actually from the Alexander Bloch's poem 12, the whispering of uh, the parts of this poem. Do you 
you have special sound people you work with? So this is the another shadow installation. Um, and talking um, about installation, uh, I also wanted to share um, my love for non-conventional, non-traditional, exhibitional spaces that I have throughout my art practice for years. Uh, so I started it in, can we switch the slide? Yeah, uh, so I started it doing that in 2016 in the care home, in the very remote care home in Russia, uh, where I went to visit the elderly people who lived there. And I went there quite often, like every weekend. It's like 300 kilometers away from Moscow. And I was thinking, what can I do there? Um, because I cannot th sing songs, I don't have like nice voice. Uh, so I was thinking, maybe I can actually draw something. And uh, the director of this care home, he proposed me to have a residency there. So I actually went there for a summer and I lived uh, in, the in the home for three weeks. Uh, and I started getting to know all the people there very well, and I asked them, what do you want me to draw? And they told me, maybe we can do some rugs, some carpets on the walls, because this is a tradition uh, in post-Soviet uh, <coughs> countries to, do, uh, to have these rugs on the walls uh, for just to keep it warm and to keep it entertaining, you know, the space where you live. Uh, so, and it was uh, not possible for them to have it on the walls because of the fire. So I proposed them to draw it directly on the walls. Uh, and with the help of the residents, uh, we did, I lived there for three weeks and we drew four rugs together. And uh, I also showed them some of the um, contemporary artists, Kabakov, Bulato, for example. Uh, and uh, also this is a very important tradition to take selfies uh, with the, carpet background, you know. Uh, so we did a lot of these selfies together. Uh, and at the end of my residency, we did uh, the opening rece reception night where we, of course, couldn't have any alcohol, but juice were, was permitted. And uh, I printed all these photos and um, um, I showed them all these rugs and somebody who didn't see it because it's quite a huge care home, uh, they actually tried to, you know, to pull it a little bit because they were thinking that it's like a real rug, that they finally have it. Um, and it's still there, so it stays in this care home. Yeah, I think it's wonderful that you participated with children and then you participated, you did these things with old people. We use a term that's actually devised by a Russian art historian, Nikolai Sorin Chaikov, in my MA, Ethnographic Conceptualism. And in fact, there's a very fuzzy border between this kind of social practice linked to a residency and what a discovery it was for you, because normally it's a sort of thing you wouldn't know. But also, of course, especially knowing my coma in Melamed, I'm fascinated by the iconography and the deers and the snow scenes and, you know, most popular paintings. Did you discuss the iconography 
with the people there and ask them what, what they'd like you to paint and draw? Yes, yes, of course. It's their home, so it was important for me that they like mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. they cho chose the design of the drugs. I just found mm -hmm. a bunch of them on the internet, and they're like this, this, and this. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice, and also very life-enhancing and making them happy. Mm -hmm. It shows that you know art can have an active effect. Yeah, yeah, and it made me happy too. Mm. I, I think it's very reciprocal mm. in this case. And another um, non-conventional exhibitional space uh, was uh, this work that is titled Piquet, uh, and I did it in 2019. Uh, First, uh, this work, this, uh, it's a series of watercolors. Um, and um, originally it was a banner that I wanted to take with me to the anti-corruption protest in Russia because it was a very famous case with a journalist, Ivan Golunov. Uh, police uh, planted drugs on him and wanted to put him in jail because of his investigation. And a lot of people were very angry about it. And they went outside to the streets. So. Uh, originally this work was a banner and then I decided to extend it to more like public space and this is a garage residency uh, I participated that time and um, I put uh, all these works all these watercolors colors inside in the windows so people could actually see it from uh, the outside because it's a very famous park in Russia so a lot of people walk around and uh, it was a, like a public statement public uh, work and it then also makes the space look like a prisoner and though as though they're kind prisoners of, inside. Yeah, yeah could I just ask you very briefly how did you with this subject in mind think of doing these large-scale watercolors when watercolors are normally associated for example with King Charles doing little landscapes, <laughs> or uh, you know, it's a very funny medium, isn't it? And also, yeah. normally, any depiction of anything, or even any photograph in the Russian tradition of crowds protesting, everyone is miniaturized. How did you come to make these life size, or even slightly more than life size? Uh, I actually adore this paradox uh, because usually my watercolors colors are very political and very social and the medium that I use watercolor is very vulnerable and, and soft. The, the yes and soft and the protest itself is also very vulnerable because it's very hard for these people especially now and for these women in black that we see here to go outside and protest so it's it's kind of I think the medium itself supports the idea of how vulnerable is somebody's freedom and somebody's life. But did it just come to you by space? chance? Were you use uh, no, how, what's actually your practice with watercolor? It, it came to me. I really adored watercolor, but then it came to me just occasionally because uh, I started working on the big scale watercolor and I fell asleep, and I slept mm -hmm. there. And it was first time when I had a big studio. And uh, when I woke up, I realized how interesting are these some kind of camouflage blobs because I left a lot of water uh, and a lot of watercolor itself. And I started, develop, I started to develop this technique. And then I came to the core, uh, how to use it and how to combine it with my idea. So it's all, all because uh, it's like so tiring to do this kind of large scale and you need to take a nap and then the miracle <laughs> happens. Yes, it's, and it's very moving. And this is the Cosmos Market? Yes, it's an art yes. fair. And it was very important for me to put this protesters in and the art fair. And you told me that when you actually came into the space, which I thought I recognized from a book fair, I still don't know if it's the same place, this was smack in the eyeball of the public first yeah, as they yeah, came yeah, in. So yeah. it was a hugely political gesture yeah. at mm -hmm. the time. Were, were you a known name by that time? Um, no, not really. I, I had several shows before and um, um, I worked with the Excel gallery and they showed mm. my works a lot. But your gallerist here was also being courageous. But at this time, 2019, you weren't fearing any comeback. It was everyone was quite happy that it should be here and also it's using that very special color red it's different from your shadow things here mm -hmm. 
So it was really very, very bold. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But I wanted to show this anger and this rage that, that mm. these people have. Mm. That was the idea behind this red color. It's so sad for me that my artist Gerard Fromanger, who in the 1968 used red silhouettes, he, I would love to have introduced you both to each other, and he died only last year. But it's an extraordinary transference with the same kind of impulse. And of course, the idea is that everybody could be anybody, and everybody, anybody can stand up for everybody. And so its delicacy is extraordinary with this very big white ground. Is that just bare ground or is that painted? Is it, is it, um, no, it's primer? just paper. It's just, it's, it's still just paper. Pa it's yeah, just paper. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And does that still exist like that stretched or did you just take it off and roll it up? What, what happens? No, afterwards? it's just a roll. Yeah, yeah yes, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. It, when it's like such a big work, mm. it exists mm. as a roll. Yeah. Mm. I never stretched this size of watercolor. And I think what also is moving, seeing the garage and seeing the Excel gallery and seeing this kind of space is that for those of us who visit Moscow regularly, Russians or people like me, these are now spaces that I, I don't know when I'll see them again. I know some people can travel to and fro, but it's very poignant for me even to see the space and the energy of this kind of exhibition. So um, it's a good, m a, good, a good stepping stone for the rest of our discussion. In fact, it would make a great picture to have these and these together. Ah, oh, yes, so we're going off to Japan now and another yeah, special... Yeah, just a quick... Um, mm. A couple other ideas for non-conventional exhibitional spaces. So uh, I was invited to participate in another Alp festival. It's in Nagana Prefecture in Omachi region in Japan. Uh, it's a, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Uh, it has mountains and seven lakes. Uh, and uh, the director of the festival, he pr uh, asked me where I want to exhibit. Uh, and um, I went to the sightseeing and uh, they showed me this Buddhist temple, and I was so, so moved by this temple. So I decided to create a work um, especially for this place, and also working with people. So um, I asked people who uh, come to this temple every day uh, to pose for me and uh, to bring something very valuable for themselves. Because um, this uh, city, it was a very important transpo transportational uh, hub in the past. So the predecessors of these people, they transported salt before. So that's why I asked them to bring something very valuable, like their relatives did uh, in the past. So somebody uh, took uh, their kids, somebody took Shiba Inu, the dog, <laughs> somebody took something more material. Uh, and um, I didn't want to disturb the space itself, so that's why uh, we decided to uh, do these constructions and not to put the works on the walls. And the last uh, non-conventional exhibitional space that uh, I want to present is this balcony gallery that uh, saved my life <laughs> during uh, p the pandemic and during quarantine. Because I was stuck uh, in Croatia, in Zagreb, where I did a residency, I have an academia residency in 2020. And I rented an apartment, a tiny apartment there. And when the COVID hit, I couldn't get back home. So um, I was quite upset. But then I was like, okay, what should I do? What do I have? I was started thinking about something that I have instead of something that I don't have. And I realized that I have the balcony. That's a lot. <laughs> Uh, and um, I decided to exhibit all my works uh, that's supposed to go to the show uh, just at, at my balcony. So I did 20 exhibitions uh, on this balcony, uh, presented my works and works of other artists. Uh, and of course I had some unexpected interactions, like the birds who pooped on the works <laughs> and the bugs. Uh, but I started sitting on the balcony and uh, saw a lot of dogs who walked with their owners and saved them uh, from boredom and loneliness. Uh, and I started to do this exhibition for the dogs, so Zagreb city dogs uh, who were present that time. 
And then when I ran out of paper, I was thinking, okay, what I have now? And I had like towel paper, of course, and no, toilet paper because everybody told that it's like ap apocalypse and we will not have any paper towels anymore. So I bought a lot, of course. And uh, I did my drawings and my sketches on this paper. Um, and um, it was very beautiful with the wind, you know, blowing back and forth. So it was the last uh, exhibition on my balcony. And then this gallery uh, started to be a nomadic balcony gallery. And uh, um, I did this installation um, with the size of my real balcony from Zagreb in different exhibitional spaces, even uh, in the Kosmosko Art Fair, where I presented my works and works of other artists. Um, and one of the artists that I presented actually lived in the care home that time, uh, Zhenia. And you see the small portraits uh, behind me on this photo. This is her works. Um, and I actually sold it to the collectors. So I was, once I was a very um, good gallerist in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very moving. And also it's interesting how ideas can take off. And this idea of nomadism is very interesting in terms of your work and how it embraces people and the people, the silhouettes don't change, uh, even when the people are changing. Um, and the different colors, it's a very, very beautiful idea. I see that is still in the cosmosphere, isn't it, with that ceiling? Yes, this yes. is an installation yes. uh, that Qatar mm. Embassy supported and we built uh, the whole balcony and people can climb and see and watch around. It looks to me as though you dominated that art fair. Um, it was another <laughs> one. <laughs> it was another year. Oh, another year. I <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. I see. I see. Well, anyway, bravo. <laughs> so um, what happens next on your PowerPoint? So this is the last project that I want to discuss before we mm. uh, actually jump to the current show mm. because it has a connection with the show that we see here. And it's titled Time Difference. Um, um, this the story of this exhibition that took place at the Excel Gallery in 2021. It was my last solo show in Moscow. Um, and um, I was very curious about history and how people are telling the stories and how they tell their stories for themselves, the story of their life and the story of the global politics or society where they live. So I started conducting this interview where I asked people, where, when, when did you start feeling that you actually live in history? And uh, th that time I did it with my peers, so people who are, are around like 30, 35, uh, 40. And um, I recorded these interviews and um, based on these interviews, I did this three, this installation uh, that has three parts. The first parts were uh, these small um, tablets with the videos, with the animation that included the interviews themselves. The second part was this huge mural, so all this um, drawing that you see, it's, it's not on paper, it's actually on the wall. So I spent two weeks in this gallery uh, and I painted the whole gallery. It's a really huge space. Um, and um, I was thinking that usually murals um, tell the stories from the authorities, from the government, the official narrative of this history that we have. So I wanted to do the opposite, uh, as I did with, with this video in this country, uh, when I told the stories from the kids. Uh, and I wanted to tell the stories from my peers, their own kind of perception of the history. Uh, and I wanted to do it with the mural because um, of this tradition of the historic murals. And of course, it, it's all were erased um, after the show. So as all the stories of these people, the, their personal perceptions uh, probably will be also erased someday. Um, so that's how this question started for me. How did you start feeling that you actually live in history that I ask people now during this show? And uh, the last project that I'm doing now, uh, the working um, name of it is Anti-Monuments. 
and now I'm living in the United States and I'm asking women who immigrated to the United States this question and their experience of immigration. And based on this, it's very deep interviews, it's about like three hours or something, and sometimes we became friends with these women. And... Uh, so I is three hours related to the duration of the painting experience mm. or is it separate? It's, uh, no, I painted separately. Yeah. I interviewed them and then painted it. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show what kind of form it also takes, these questions, and where it goes. And this is like the most recent work that I did before coming here to London. There's three triptychs, and every triptych is dedicated to one person whom I interviewed. So this is to Cristina. Uh, she's a very famous Mexican writer, Cristina Rivera Garza. Um, and this is to Bulbana. Uh, she is a political refugee from Kazakhstan, now seeking a political asylum in New York. And this is to Adela, she's professor of history in the Houston University. Um, and but do men part in, there are no men in this project? No. No, no, no. <laughs> it's interesting because you're obviously very deeply and interestingly a feminist, but uh, it's, it, your work is also gentle and it seems inevitable almost that these are all going to be women. Did you ever have any straightforward feminist awakening yourself, historically speaking, or did it all just come naturally? I think in ca it came naturally with the war, actually, because mm -hmm. the most um, active anti-war initiative from Russia is a feminist anti-war resistance who actually inspired this show and everything that we see oh around. That's so interesting. It's like the mothers of the disappeared in yeah. Latin mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's very moving. So perhaps that leads us naturally into, shall we talk about upstairs and then downstairs, how, how this exhibition came to be. And what I particularly like in this space, and I remember exhibitions of Victoria Lamasco on the walls and exhibitions of Yevgeny Fix with paper hanging from the walls, is this space itself, which sometimes one doesn't think is designed for this kind of thing, goes so beautifully with this work that is light and ephemeral, fragile, but in each case very political. So you, 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 you fit perfectly into this, into this mystically interesting series, which most people don't really know about uh, as a concept of a series. But of course you came to see the space, or did you come with all the work already, you came with the work already done, but you knew about the space, you discussed it with Elena. Uh, you knew how many pieces would go, uh, and yet, presumably, you painted these in America, and then they were rolled up and came with you. Um, and so, how is that kind of transnational experience as you're, as you're making these works? In your, of course, you're very dreamy. I haven't asked you when your birthday is, if you're a Piscean, a dreamy Piscean like me, but... Um, um, there is this sense which persists of dream or memory, as you say, and it's about memory, about intense moments which become memories. Tell us some more. Uh, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually was not think thinking about myself as dreamy. I was thinking about, about myself as a realist. <laughs> a realist? <laughs> oh, that's that's great, yeah. <laughs> um, so the idea of all this uh, series came to my mind after the war started, and feminist anti-war resistance group, uh, they decided to launch this um, action, Women in Black Against the War, that is very old, protest uh, that um, actually was started in Israel in 1988 as a response to the war and then it was spread around the world so now there are a lot of women in black groups in different countries and um, feminist anti-war resistance decided to join them and to join this protest and it's very simple protest when you don't have any means to uh, speak up publicly uh, about your opinion, about your stand. Uh, you can just go outside, wear black, and take a white flower with you as a symbol of peace. And uh, many, many women from Russia joined this protest, and then they put all these photos online, but they 
kind of cropped or erased their faces to be anonymous, so the authorities cannot trace them and put them in jail. So all these works are based on actual photos that I found online, and um, the photos pictured the women. So this is the most documentary, documentary work that I've done, because every work here is done um, based on the very specific case, on the very specific um, political stand that these women had. When I see things like, for me, that is like anti-nuclear, um, and this is more to do with um, abortion rights and women's rights, women's reproductive rights. So they're not all protesting about the same thing. Um, is this because the women in black movement embrace many different forms of protest? Yes, and actually all these are protesting against the war. Um, but of course they're doing a lot of other activities and they just defend like basic human rights mm -hmm. and they work in prison a lot. And I actually met a couple of days ago, I met the real women in black who are very active, who were very active in Yugoslavia and I went to the launch of their book, the book presentation and it was very, so very lovely. So you in Yugoslavia, did you? Where did you huh? say it was? Where did you meet them? I'm, I met them here. Oh Some here? of them live here. Oh yeah, gosh. yeah, yeah. Mm. And they just um, published a book about the movement uh, in different countries. And Noritz actually wrote the one of the chapters. Mm. And um, it was very, very moving for me and for them to meet here in the exhibition space, but then to for me to go to their presentation and see how active they still are and how they try to resist the nuclear power now, nuclear weapons. Mm, that's very moving. And, and this, the silence here and the sense of anonymity in presentation paradoxically contrasts so much with the mini biographies downstairs of the prisoners who've been locked up. And yet, especially for us, and especially for those of us who can't read the Russian, they're also semi-anonymous. And also, so part of your act in that case with the prisoners, political prisoners downstairs is an act of commemoration and actually putting their biographies, you know, into the world again. Um, of course, you weren't able to see them and they weren't posting their own photos on that line, but you used other photographic material from newspapers or from stills of television to, to get the... I mean, it's very striking. These have no faces. And downstairs, the faces are very striking. The looks are very striking. And hence, one's perception of you as a portraitist is very striking. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the prisoners and how you selected them. You told me it was a very moving experience for you. And at a certain moment, you felt you had to stop. You could have gone on and on. Yes, actually I took all the photos and all the information about them from the memorial website. It's an oh, yes. organization in Russia who just got a Nobel Prize. Uh, and they're doing a lot to save all the memories uh, uh, and all to trace all the political prisoners. So I think it's just because of them I, it was possible to find any information because these people are so anonymous and some of them are actually very famous but most of them are invisible. And um, yes, I was thinking should I write it in Russian or in English, the captions, but I've... Um, I decided to do it in, in, in Russian uh, with the hope that one day I can show it in Russia itself and it will be the document of this time and of these people who protested and who gave their freedom to protest. You remind me, of course, that protests began before Crimea with Pussy Riot, which was like 2011, 12. <coughs> and um, when you're speaking, I'm thinking of my extraordinary encounter with a poetess called Irina something, who wrote a book called Pencil Letters. And I realized that when I first went to the USSR so excitedly, rather apprehensively, she was actually, or was about to be, put into prison for writing poems. And I only discovered this years later. Um, and I'd like to, you know, pay her homage. And she was in prison for a very long time, and then she came out. But it was extraordinary the way that one can 
the way that one learns about things and the way that history repeats itself. And of course, we've just seen all the things on the news uh, about Navalny and about um, Sodorovsky, who preceded him in terms of this international coverage of people behind prison bars. Um, but again, it's the lightness of touch and the paper and the fragility, the way things are just pinned on the wall downstairs, which implies how easily they could be blown away or scrumpled up or replaced, simply replaced by something else. Um, and I think it's very, you've, you wrote all those captions out by yourself by hand, presumably, in, in pencil as well, not in ink. Again, very fragile and ephemeral. I hope that one day I can erase it and rewrite their histories, that mm. they got free and they became very active mm. in Russia itself. That's mm. also with hope. And so, of course, when you've been doing your silhouette portraits, your shadow portraits of the of the people who've come to this exhibition, many of them must have been speaking to you, not just about when history came into their lives, but about the present situation and also what looking as spectators at those portraits mean to them. So could you tell us about some of your encounters with shadow portraits before we get on to the making of shadow portraits themselves? Um, I think, so, this was another part of the exhibition, uh, more interactive. I invited people to the um, drawing session uh, and I traced their shadows and then uh, we sit at the table and talk. And I asked them my um, big question, how did you start feeling that you actually live in history? Uh, and everybody took this question very differently, of course. Somebody um, gave me really personal testimonies. Somebody spoke about politics. Somebody cried. Mm -hmm. Somebody uh, asked me this question. It was actually uh, very surprising because I was not ready to <laughs> answer by myself. <laughs> so I was lost. <laughs> um, but um, I think uh, personally for me as an artist, it was very important part of the whole show because in a couple of weeks I met like around 50 people and I had very deep conversations with them and it's not possible to do it in real life of course because you never have time to sit with somebody whom you never met before and like talk with like for one hour and ask very deep questions you know um, so I don't know how it for for the people whom I drew but for, for myself uh, I think it was very, very, very rewarding because um, I felt very connected with all the participants and I felt that the drawing itself was this kind of bridge to for this communication because it was not just like, you know, how did you start feeling that you have different history and I'm like staring in their eyes, you know? No, I was looking at my painting and I was busy so they could relax and they could think about their story and sometimes uh, it was silence and it was very comfortable silence not like usual when you meet somebody new and you need to think oh my gosh what should I say now you know it's mm -hmm. so embarrassing so yeah it was not embarrassing at all it was very very inspiring did they all take their paintings away um, I think they all will <laughs> but they all yeah. will in the future because I wondered how you were going to commemorate this. You obviously have the recording, and I thought that if, you were going, if they were going to take them away, you would take a photograph of the painting or something, but you aren't going to turn them into an exhibition. Whoops, sorry. You're not going to turn them into an exhibition. Uh, no, actually, not yet, not yet. We'll see. Maybe um, I will do some other project using, using these testimonies, of course, anonymous, um, but for this portrait, it was the idea that I will give it to people who participated. And they um, made a small donation uh, to support the Ukrainian refugees for oh. this. So it's actually a fundraising uh, action mm. too. Mm. But um, 
Along with the small portraits, I did my own big works based uh, on these shadow sessions. And this is just part of the big series that I started a couple years ago that is titled How to Become Invisible. And I'm tracing the shadows, uh, but now I decided to make the, the compositions with this. And this is like a couple of the works. This one I actually made yesterday. So this is like the, the most fresh <laughs> art. Can I just <laughs> ask you one question? I think people had to book sessions with you, but does it mean that you actually have their names and their surnames? You have both yes. their names, because obviously when you just say to Sarah or to Christine, that's a form of anonymizing. So ultimately you will have a kind of repertoire, because obviously in one way this is, it's in a very, very sensual painting and it's nonetheless a conceptual project. Very, very interesting. I do think you must obviously think of publishing, types of publishing and publishing opportunities. Of course, as somebody studies a lot of French art, I'm very interested in the, what's called the beau livre. And I can imagine your work, um, you, you know, works like this, but on, on smaller, but quite large scale on beautiful paint, uh, beautiful paper with testimonies on the other side as a kind of uh, a, a, a commemorative book. So it's interesting to what extent you might like you know, you're very interested in commemoration from Proust onwards. Yes. So, so the medium of commemoration and how virtual or evanescent or material that is, is so important. Yes, but I was thinking if I write it on the back of the watercolors, it will be like not very anonymous and people will not trust me. So I think if I use this testimonies, maybe I can do it in more like indirect way, like my video in this country with the shadows or something mm -hmm. more subtle. Yes, your idea of trust is interesting because I remember teaching a lot of performance art before somebody wrote a wonderful book which was about the contract, the contract between the performer and the audience, the contract about when to say stop and the question of trust that's involved in contract. Obviously, when one studies conceptual art, there are all sorts of other things to do with gallerists and money and other kinds of contract people like studying. But in fact, this very delicate, again, idea of trust as being essential to your work, I think, is, is really a very interesting idea as a baseline. Trust linked with distance, um, but uh, linked with distance and with criticality, but actually something very tender and expanding outwards. I'm thinking that surely the audience, Elena, may also wish to ask questions. I think perhaps it would be a lovely time. Yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, it was fascinating, and thank you for sharing so generously kind the 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 internal process of your of your art making and you've talked a lot about works on paper and can you maybe speak a bit about your about film and animation because well we've seen um, the the in the beginning uh, you talked a bit about uh, the animation but I know that you also work with video so if you could speak a bit about that Uh, video is just very different process because uh, with the watercolor you can just do everything by yourself you know you control everything but when you are doing a video you need like a, a crew or uh, you need somebody who's in charge for the sound or when it's like the puppet shows shadow theater I actually produce I think the production time for this work was one year because I did every scene by hand I did all the puppets all the shadows, cutouts, and everything. And I had much more footage that you saw, of course. So um, if I have this means of production in the future, I would be happy, of course, to do more and more videos because I love how time works in the films because it's very different. Because like watercolors or painting, they're more instant. But the video, it, it involves time and it involves, involves time for the viewer and for me to make it. Um, so, yes, I think it's very different processes, but uh, I adore them both.
Um, thank you very much for that. It was it was great. Um, I, I remember I, I spoke with you in Moscow at your your last for now exhibition there, Time Difference, that you, we saw some pictures of. And I remember you saying then that you don't consider yourself a political artist, you consider yourself a socially engaged artist. I wondered if that had changed with the war in Ukraine and more generally, how has the full-scale invasion changed your practice, if it has, and your thoughts about yourself as a Russian artist? Yes, of course it changed and now I can call myself political artist. You know. Um, and uh, actually these works changed it a lot because uh, when the war started I was thinking how I can do any artwork, it's just there is no sense in it. Uh, I started volunteering uh, but then I was thinking okay I need to go out from this dark, uh, dark uh, state of mind because it doesn't get me anywhere so uh, I saw this um, women in black movement and I was so inspired by it and I was thinking okay maybe this uh, I can show this because when th this women put it uh, on the internet these photos they just disappear you know it's very instant um, but with this works maybe they will live somewhere you know and when they are exhibited they actually very present because I feel they're protesting here among us. Um, and I'm very happy this is like the third exhibition of this works. Uh, I did it in the United States, in Japan, and now it's here. So um, I'm very grateful that our they're traveling and uh, this protest is always alive when it's on the walls. Um, so yes, and then I started to do this political prisoners um, portraits and uh, it was very hard for me because I actually uh, read all the stories about them, all the cases and initially I wanted to do all the 500 political prisoners but then I, would think I understood it's just impossible in this short period of time and with all of this um, information of the oppression and mm, that is behind them. Um, yeah, so I did like around 40 at the end. Yeah, so I think I changed and um, I hope uh, this works uh, can actually show that the protest against the war in Russia itself exists. Thank you very much for your talk and, and for sharing your trajectory uh, with us. I, I find it very fascinating how you uh, started with this animation about the Soviet Union and uh, now reflecting on um, contemporary events in Russia. And I'm looking at this at, at the last project, How to Become Invisible, and see this very interesting dialogue between two women in this, in this project, and I'm quite intrigued with the title of it and wha what is going on in this uh, work. Is it a little bit more? Actually, I started this project a couple of years ago when I did the shadow portraits of um, um, cultural workers. And that's why I titled it How to Become, in Become Invisible, because I felt that cultural work is very, very invisible. Um, and um, But here I did this uh, works mostly with the Russians who came here to London to escape the war. So for them, this is the place where they can be invisible for the government. So this work just uh, changed, but the title itself, it, it works, it still works. So your question about uh, the Daria Sirenko's book, uh, Girls and Institutions, that I really adore. I recommend everybody to read this book. Daria is an activist and uh, she's one of the founders of Feminist Anti-War Resistance Group. And she worked as a director in the State Gallery in Moscow. 
and uh, she wrote a book about her experience, how to be an activist and the director of the gallery, because when they hired her, they didn't know that she's an activist. So it was a, a, a great coincidence. And um, she wrote a very, very um, mm, poetic book about it and about um, this experience to be a, s a little woman who is trying to change something in this big state. Um, and um, yes, being invisible on some levels, yeah. Yes, yes. They, yeah. Um, I actually, uh, sorry, uh, may I ask a question? Um, s I, I'm really interested. Um, you know, we see a lot of artists who address uh, the same kind of topic uh, from different angles and different media. And uh, when I was looking at the images of your work, uh, I couldn't um, help asking myself, uh, you know, you, you often um, go, I mean, use this medium, uh, this watercolor ink on paper, but you cover, you address very different issues and different you know, situations um, going back to this medium, which is very specific, very recognizable. It's all these Kati Muram Seva. And uh, I'm wondering why you're doing that. Like, how, what's, what's interesting in, in that? And you know, when, when uh, for many artists, that becomes kind of uh, some sort of a commercial trademark. You know, we, we can see that, oh, this artist always uses th this medium and, you know, then it's, it's obviously them. But with you, you know, I, I cannot suspect you of that, and I, uh, I, I feel that there is something else. But you know, you find yourself in different cities, in different countries, in different situations, working with diff different topics. But it seems that in every country, city, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you find some watercolor paper, you find w some uh, watercolor ink, and you start, you know, working. And it never, it seems that it never bores you. So can you can you describe your emotions in relation to that? I like it because it's so unpredictable. Because uh, this technique, how I actually do it, I put the paper on the floor, I fix it with the tape, that I'm doing the um, pencil contour, and then I put water, and then inside the water, I put watercolor. So uh, mostly, I don't use any brushes. I just mix the colors and pour it, like j watercolor Jackson Pollock. So, um, what what is really interesting for me in this process that I never know how it would dry, uh, so it's always a surprise, and that's why I love art. It's always has this space for sur for surprise and for some kind of hope, and I always have this hope that it will not leak at the end; <laughs> it will stay in the borders. <laughs> You chose blue for me, and I was delighted. <coughs> but you must have feelings that relate non nonetheless to whether someone's going to be a pink person or a green person or a blue person uh, when you're making these things, when you're making these. And of course, your, your most recent work is very much more colorful, isn't it? The very big pieces. Maybe you could talk a little bit about color as we're surrounded by monochrome here. Yes, when I'm doing uh, shadows from people, um, Sometimes it's related with their kind of aura, you know, of with their presence that I feel. But sometimes it's just like, what kind of colors do I have today, <laughs> honestly? <laughs> so, um, and the last work is so, yes, it's very, very colorful. And um, because I was trying to um, do something something else, you know, like every work, I'm trying to go somewhere else. I mean, I have these rules, but it's always cool to break your own rules when you have it, uh, even for a little bit. Um, and of course, this all these works are monochrome because it's women in black, so they're mostly black and a little bit uh, blue. Um, and yes, so this is more like a document, and this is more emotional in terms of um, the response of the person that I see. Um, I'd like to thank both Katya and, and um, for, well, certainly 
the, the story of how you develop your work is, is absolutely fascinating. And um, thank you, Sarah, for the teasing out and illuminating and <laughs> giving us the framework. It's, it's, it has been a wonderful talk. I, I would like to ask you, um, when you did your protest works in Russia, uh, how they were received and um, what effect they had on you, uh, whether there was any control, any um, negative uh, feedback on that. And the second part of my question is really, do you do this work in the United States and how, does, how is it received? Um, I actually did all this work in the United States. All the women in black um, were made there because I lived there for two years now. And uh, when I did it in Russia, I actually exhibited this red watercolors in the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. Uh, so in the State Museum. And it was still possible. It was 2019, I think, yes. So everything is changing really, really, really fast in Russia in terms of politics and in terms of censorship too. For now, I think it's like not possible at all to show this kind of works or this women in black. But back uh, that time, it was possible. And um, I actually didn't have any problems. Um, I think the opposite. I had a lot of feedback for this work from people because Moscow is a very protest city, and a lot of people responded on this work. But I didn't show it anywhere else except Moscow. So maybe in different cities it will look differently. Thank you. Um, Katya, thank you very much for this beautiful um, um, and uh, very encouraging exhibition. And so I thank you for um, um, asking um, uh, the uh, questions. Um, you call yourself a political artist. Um, and uh, obviously this exhibition has a very strong political um, touch. And these uh, um, images basically are calling to us to do something, to act. And um, as a political artist, at least um, in terms of this series. Um, I was wondering, and I, I'd like to ask you, um, I mean, these works are very informative. And Sarah mentioned that there are many um, topics um, on the um, 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 planchet, which these uh, um, uh, women um, keep. So this is a lot of information going on. And for you, as an artist, um, what does it mean to keep, uh, to keep a balance between information and aesthetic? And is there any balance? Uh, is it important for you? Is there any balance? Do you think about it? Or is more, um, it's very natural and just you work and you don't think about it? Thank you so much. It's a very interesting question because uh, I heard some critique on this work that is too beautiful. Um, and um, I think it was my point because I wanted to, I think the aesthetics here actually works for people to spend time with this work. Because if it's not so-called beautiful, uh, people will just run away. Uh, and um, I really tried to keep uh, this balance uh, with between information and aesthetics here. Um, and um, I hope it worked out. <laughs> well, I think it's worked out very movingly and very effectively, Katya. I think it's really very, very powerful. And this softness does draw us in and makes us also think not of people as emblems or emblems of protest, but as subjectivities. And of course, w your work is all involved with these individual subjectivities, however they are shaped by history. And you've discovered that the ordinary person on the street or the person you draw, all of them have stories inside to do with this moment of an encounter with history, which is what I think is so moving in these anonymous and once named people. 
So perhaps, are there any more questions? If not, perhaps we'd all like to thank you, Katya, so much for giving us this opportunity to see your work and to talk. Oh, there is one more question. Yes? No? Well, I'd like to um, offer a round of applause to Katya. Thank you so much. <laughs>